Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Southside Sunday School. I'm Joe Farless. We'll be leading in our study today. I uh, hope you have your Bibles uh, with you. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We will begin our reading with verse 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 1. There's so much to get through today. Um, I really do encourage you, and I may encourage you at the end of this study as well. Go back and read this chapter over and over and over again. It is so practical in or for the um, benefit of us trying to live after um, our union with Christ, after we accept his death on the cross as payment for our sin. We have to live a certain way. God wants us to live a certain way. You know, in, in, in the, uh, one of the letters of Peter, he said, uh, he quotes an Old Testament scripture that God says to his people, be holy for I am holy. And um, for the most part, I think that frustrates the normal Christian on just about any given day uh, because we're so used to uh, sin. Uh, sin coming and tempting us. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how sin reigns in our mortal body, but we don't serve that master anymore. Romans chapter 6 is a transitional point for um, believing or for believers uh, to gain a foothold uh, into the kingdom, so to speak. Uh, because in this, Paul, uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes and tells us just exactly how we must feel and what it is that we must know to be true after our union with Jesus Christ. So I hope you're excited about this study. I know I am. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your love and guidance. We thank you for the grace that you cover us with and the mercy that you extend to us each and every day. Father, we're not good people, but we want to be. Help us, Father, as we study in this book of Romans to understand what it is that you would have us to. By your Holy Spirit, Father, teach us today. Give us wisdom. Give us guidance. Father, give us a quietness in our soul. Uh, Father, as we read these words, uh, Father, not necessarily as I say them, but Father, as your Spirit speaks to us, Father, help us to grow in Christ, that we may be more pleasing to you, better ambassadors uh, to serve you in this sin-darkened world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 6. Our focal passages are actually uh, verse 5 down through 14, but I'm going to read just a little bit more because it, it, the whole chapter is just so very important. Uh, I won't read uh, the whole chapter, but a whole lot of it okay so romans chapter 6 beginning with verse 1 what shall we say then after what he said in 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 chapter 5 and you can you can read that for yourself but he says shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. You know, nobody wants to be a slave. Nobody wants to be in prison. And uh, <clears throat> we may sound like the Pharisees if we say or if we answer that uh, implied question, who are you a slave to, uh, in the reality that we live in these United States, we are a slave to no man. We've never been slaves. We're not going to be slaves as far as we know. Uh, but Paul's not talking about, and the Bible's not teaching about our slavery to any man or any institution. He's talking about uh, the worst slave master of all, and that is of sin. 
But the good news of Jesus Christ is that he sets us free from this slavery. You know, some were confused in Paul's day, and that's kind of what he was talking about at first. Some were confused in Paul's day, thinking that um, uh, <clears throat> uh, they thought that since Jesus had completely paid for our sin debt, that we could keep on sinning with no consequences. And we could even give God more opportunity to show his grace and to show his mercy if we had sinned ever more. He said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? I'm sorry, what? Dead to sin? <clears throat> I was reading from verse 2 there. Paul firmly denounced this gross error of being able to freely sin so that uh, we could have abundant grace. Jesus did not set us free from the guilt of sin so that we could sin without consequences, but so that we can walk in newness of life. So what did Paul mean by this newness of life? He began by stressing our eternal and new relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, if we have been unified with him, let's go on to verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is free from sin. You know, I've heard it put this way. Um, you take an addict who is addicted to painkillers, just say, for instance. They get up in the morning and they're addicted to painkillers and, and all they want is something to... to um, the, 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 they need something to get that fix. They need something to feel a certain way. So they're, they're enslaved, so to speak, to the power of that painkiller. But if that addict dies and he's in that coffin, he's no longer, is he still addicted to that painkiller? No, he's not. Or no, she's not. They're freed from that because of death. It may seem kind of a, a weird way of looking at that, but they are no longer under the influence of that painkiller. They are no longer under the influence to, to do anything that it takes to steal and to rob and, to, and to, to lie and to cheat people to try to get what it is that they're addicted to. They no longer have to do that because they are dead to the influence of that painkiller. Let's put it in terms that the Bible's talking about now. If we have been unified with him in the likeness of his death, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior have accepted the fact that, that Jesus went to the cross and our sins were nailed to the cross with him. And he died because of being nailed to that cross. He gave up his life to pay for our sin because the Bible says that all men sin and are worthy of death. Let me find my place here. We have been united with him. Curious of sense is that because we have, this relationship is, is, a, is a present reality. The main idea is that we have been connected with Jesus in a unique way in the likeness of his death. Let me explain, or let me explain. Let me read some of how our lesson writer today points it out. To receive a new life in Christ, a person must also participate in his death. Maybe you have, maybe you've never even considered something like this, but think about it. What Paul meant was that we must die to the appetites of our human nature so that our central desire is to allow Christ to live in us. That we must die to the appetites of our human nature 
so that our central desire is to allow Christ to live in us. Jesus died on the cross, was buried as proof that he was dead. Then, God raised him from the dead. Jesus said, I took my, he said, I give my life. He said, I take it up again. This is the resurrection. As we willingly lay down our lives in order to join Jesus in dying, we accept what he did as, as payment for our sin. We give our life to him. We pledge our life to him. We say, Jesus, I am no more. I give you my life uh, because of what you have done for me. And I want to turn my back on sin. This is illustrated uh, as we're, we willingly lay down our lives in order to join Jesus in dying, and then we are able to join him in his resurrection. It's illustrated in our baptism. When the pastor says of the new believer, as he raises him or her from the water, raised to newness of life, raised to walk in newness of life. It's symbolism. Uh, that we are raised, that we are no longer the person that we are before. The baptismal waters has no saving power. That decision has already been made when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When, when at the moment of our acceptance is when we are born again. The baptism is a way of showing the world that uh, I have died to sin, but now I'm raised in newness of life. It's a declaration of independence, so to speak, um, from the power of sin in our life. This radical change of our spiritual being is required in order to live this new quality of life. We have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in order to do this. You know, some people want to try to fix themselves. We can't fix ourselves from sin. We can quit a whole lot of things and we can clean up our life, but our minds still wander. Our hearts still crave for sin. Our bodies follow then that craving. In verses 6 and 7, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is free from sin. Verses 6 and 7. Paul stated one of the key things we know in the light of our union with Christ in both his death and resurrection is the fact that our old self was crucified with him. Jesus was crucified, and he died. He was placed in the grave as a... Um, result of being dead like we when we die and we leave these mortal bodies our bodies are placed in a grave There's a lot of different ways um, uh, but we're we're placed in the grave this old man uh, is, is, is in reference to the prior condition of our life when when we have passed from this life and we take our last breath we are no longer under the influence of anything in this life nothing do you agree with that all right Paul says it's exactly the same way as when we identify ourselves with the death of Christ and we give our life to him we are dead to the influences of this world dead Follow me here. This is where it gets good. I mean, it's already good, but... This old man, this old self, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless. So that we may no longer be enslaved to that old man of sin. It's worn out. It's useless. The reason of this uh, level of our being was crucified with him was to free us from being enslaved to sin. Describe the slavery as the body ruled by sin. Paul often referred to two realms of our nature as one controlled by the flesh and one controlled by the spirit. What Jesus intends to happen, now, what uh, can now happen, is that our natural uncontrolled lust and sin-producing desires might be rendered powerless, defeated, overpowered by the powerful uh, relationship that we have through Jesus Christ. 
Paul did not mean that our core problem is our physical bodies. As Paul would later point out in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, the issue is who controls the healthy appetites and desires which God has placed in us when he created us. He does. This is a spiritual warfare. Not a physical one. Spiritual. There's one other point we need to clarify here, that Paul was not saying that once we have died to the power of our old ways and have been resurrected with the power to overcome sin, that we will never sin again. That's not the case. John made that perfectly clear in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. When he wrote that if, if we say that we have no sin, we're calling God a liar. That's not what we, if we claim to be sinless. That's not what I'm saying at all. Paul's goal in this passage was not to say that we are now sinless, but rather that we are now capable of learning to replace our sinful habits with godly habits. The one who has died has been resurrected to Christ. He's freed from sin in his power. Our sinful ways should grow less and less. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Because as Jesus was crucified on the cross and laid in the grave, He took up His body again and was resurrected. As we identify ourselves with a Christ, we are dead to that old way of life and raised to newness of life to walk in them. As Jesus was raised, so are we raised from the dead to walk in newness of life. That's exactly what it means. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again because death has no reign over him, has no rules over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's a lot here. <clears throat> we can now live with him in holiness. Paul stressed the assurance that we have our new status or in relationship to Christ by saying, because we know this reality, because we know. I think a lot of times once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we say we are raised to newness of life. We have, this, we have this feeling of joy, you know, that we can conquer the world. But the next morning when we rise up, the first thought in our minds sometimes is, is, is an evil thought. Or a wayward thought. And we go, gosh, well, what, am I, what am I doing? I've been raised to newness of life. I've, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. This is the Holy Spirit working in us to convict us of our sin and to lead us into um, relationship with Jesus Christ, into, into a more loving relationship, a constant relationship, a, a, a life, because we are dead to sin. Our certainty is not based on our personal experience, but on Jesus' own words as revealed by the Holy Spirit. Today we have the inspired writings of the Bible to teach us. So what do we do as new Christians? We, we delve into the Word, we dive into the Word, and we, and we read the words of God, and we, and we, we read the Gospels, we read the, we read the entire... Saturate our hearts and our minds with, with Scripture so that when those errant thoughts come, Sinful thoughts come, we can conquer them by using the Word of God. Much like Jesus conquered uh, Satan in our uh, Sunday school lessons past, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, how did he fight the tempter? By using the Word of God. You remember that? Go back and read it if you, if you don't. Anyway. Paul continued to dwell on the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection for the believer. When Jesus died on the cross, he finished his work. He died once and for all. When, Jesus raised, when God raised Jesus from the, from the grave, he showed that Jesus had not only paid the penalty of our sins, but also defeated the power of death. Death has no more dominion over him. 
When we, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, pass from this life into the next, death has no power over us anymore. It's the worst possible thing that we think that can happen to a human being is for them to lose their life. We mourn at the, at the um, final resting places of our loved ones because we remember them in their life. But death has no more dominion over them once they, once they pass from this life into the next. Paul said that when Jesus died, he died to sin, that by his death, Jesus had forever and completely taken away the power of sin that Satan exercises over human beings. Now let me read that again. I know these are the words of our um, lesson right but he says them there in Scripture. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Life he lives, he, he lives to God. By his death, Jesus had forever and completely taken away the power that sin and Satan exercise over human beings. He permanently opened the way to God's forgiveness. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for, for sin. Those who have suffered in this once for all time. Once for all time. Verse 11 states, so you too consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why does Paul, Paul spend so much time emphasizing that Jesus died to atone for our guilt? Because he was reminding the readers that Jesus' death not only atone, atone, not only atoned <laughs> for our guilt, but also freed us from our slavery to sin. He wanted Roman believers to base their lives on the reality of their freedom. He urged them to consider or to accept as true that this is true and to base their lives on two primary realities. First, truth was when they reunited themselves with Christ in his death. He also united themselves in his ability not to sin. Jesus was tempted to sin, but he refused to sin. He never gave in. Everyone else has given in to the devil's temptations. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh, everybody. However, God loved us so much that he made a way of escape. As a result of our faith commitment to follow Jesus, we simply need to keep reminding ourselves that we are dead to sin. The next time those errant thoughts come into your head or you want to do something that you know is wrong, you know it's not God's will for you in your life, then remind yourself that you are dead to sin. Yes, but you do not have to give in to that temptation. You don't have to give in to that temptation anymore. Before we were powerless to accept that. We, we chose to do those kind of things. And any errant thought, I mean, we would act on our thoughts. Now we don't have to do that anymore. Sin has no power over us except that of that temptation. We are dead to sin. Of course, dead people have no desires, no will. If we allow the Holy Spirit who lives in us to do his transforming work, look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wonderful a couple of verses of Scripture. Then we can break free of our old sinful desires and habits. That is not wishful thinking, but it is an accessible reality. The second truth that Paul stressed, the first part was truth. The, I mean, the, the, the first part was true that we are, we unite ourselves to uh, death, to uh, Christ's death. The second part stressed that believers should not only realize that they could not only leave their old ways behind, but they could learn and follow new ways. When they fully grasped that they were alive to God in Jesus Christ and they could accept, then they could accept as normal their ability to always do the right things, the things that were holy and pleasing to God. 
As James said in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, genuine faith always leads to faithful works. We need to hurry along. We've got about five minutes before we need to close. So let's look at our last portions of Scripture. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourself to God and all the parts of yourself as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. Boy, those are some declarative statements there. First word of application, do not let sin reign. Stop allowing sin to be in charge of your life. The individual believer has the ability to decide who or what reigns in their lives. Death and sin or God and Christ. Which do you choose? Yes, I'm saying and the Bible says that we choose to sin when we sin. Those errant thoughts that come into our head, I heard Billy Graham say it one time, we can't stop a thought from entering our head just as we can't stop a bird from flying over our heads. But that bird, we can stop it from building a nest in our hair, can't we? We may not be able to stop those errant thoughts from coming into our head and, and, and influencing us or tempting us, but we can keep it from staying there, can't we? We can call a trusted friend. We can open the Word of God. We can pray that the Holy Spirit take more control over our life. And we can give that control to the Holy Spirit to lead us. Sin has no more power over us. The individual believer also has the power to obey God's will instead of following the desires prompted by our sinful natures. He uses our body parts as weapons of where we use them for unrighteousness. We can use them for weapons of righteousness now. We can do the right thing. We have used our physical and mental abilities for righteousness. Resources for good because believers have died to sin. We first allow in our new lives in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit to change our motives from evil to godly desires, to holy, righteous thoughts. In addition, our abilities and talents, we also offer, offer to God. And God expects us to use those abilities and talents to further His kingdom, to show people the right way. A couple of minutes here and we'll close. Paul closed this section first to remind the readers that there was no reason for sin to rule over them. Being freed from trying to keep the law is great news, but knowing that we are under grace is even better. We are under grace. We're going to slip and fall. We're going to do the wrong things from time to time. None of us are perfect. But sin will not reign over us, and will not rule us, because we're not under the law, but under grace. When we fully realize that we are dead to sin, but alive to God, and live accordingly, then we can begin to respond appropriately to the priceless privilege of living under grace. Consider when you've been trying to live the Christian life from the outside or from the inside out. Ask God to help you rely on the power of His Spirit to overcoming sin. So what do we do this week? Invite God to expose areas of disobedience in your life. Your thoughts, beliefs, your motives, your attitudes and behaviors. Commit to confess these, seeking cleansing and freedom. God has declared you victorious over sin through Christ. Won't you live just like that? Thank you.